on November 9th and 10th of 1938. It took place throughout Germany, annexed Austria, and in areas of Czechoslovakia recently occupied by German troops. Kristallnacht owes its name to the shards of shattered glass from the windows of synagogues, homes, and Jewish-owned businesses that lie in German streets in the wake of the Pogrom. On November 7th, 1938, Ernst von Rapp, a German embassy official stationed in Paris, was assassinated by Herschel Kirschbaum, a 17-year-old Polish Jew living illegally in Paris. Kirschbaum revengefully shot the diplomat after witnessing the expulsion of not only his parents, but thousands of Jews of Polish citizenship living in the German Reich. Von Rapp died on November 9th, 1938. The same day, at a meeting of Nazi Party leadership, Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels, the chief instigator of the Kristallnacht program, suggested that world Jewry had conspired to commit the assassination and ordered that any demonstration, while not organized by the Nazi Party, shall not be hampered. Newspapers reported otherwise. After Goebbels' speech, violence erupted in various parts of the Reich. Paramilitary, or SA, and Hitler Youth units throughout Germany and its annexed territories destroyed Jewish-owned homes and businesses. Jewish artifacts were confiscated. And many young, healthy Jewish men were arrested and filled with local jails. The rioters destroyed 267 synagogues throughout Germany, Austria, and the Sudetenland. Many synagogues burned throughout the night in full view of public and of local firefighters who had received orders to intervene only to prevent flames from spreading to nearby buildings. shattered shop windows of an estimated 7,500 Jewish-owned commercial establishments and looted their wares. Jewish cemeteries became a particular object of desecration in many regions. Mobs of SA men roamed the streets, attacking Jews in their houses and forcing Jews they encountered to perform acts of public humiliation. Crystal Knox claimed the lives of at least 91 Jews. As the pogrom spread, units of the SS and Gestapo, the secret state police, arrested up to 30,000 Jewish males and transferred most of them from local prisons to Dachau and Buchenwald, as well as other concentration camps. In the immediate aftermath of the pogrom, Measures were introduced to eliminate Jews and perceived Jewish influence from the German economic sphere. The German government announced that the Jews were to blame for the pogrom imposing a fine of 400 million U.S. dollars on the German Jewish community. German education officials expelled Jewish children still attending German schools. The German government announced laws that enforced Aryanization policy the transfer of Jewish-owned enterprises and property to the Aryan's ownership. The events of Kristallnacht represented one of the most important turning points in Nazi anti-Semitic policy. The Nazi regime moved eventually towards policies of forced immigration and finally toward the realization of a Germany free of Jews by deportation of the Jewish population to the East. It is important to understand and remember these events. It is also important to honor those that lived and died during this destructive part of history. It's probably most critical that we teach the lesson so that it may never happen again.
test, everybody good? Can you hear me well? Good evening. My name is Bob Lowy, and I'm proud to be the chair of the Baltimore Jewish Council's Holocaust Remembrance Commission. In partnership with Moses Montefiore and Moon and Congregation, I'm honored to welcome you to this evening of commemoration and reflection. Before we begin, I'd like to express our gratitude to the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore, Moses Montefiore and Moon and Congregation, and to the David and Regina Weinberg Foundation, a supporting foundation of the Associated, for their generous support of tonight's program. I am pleased to invite Rabbi Rachmael Shapiro, Rabbi at Moses Montefiore, to share opening remarks. Rabbi Shapiro. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight. It's an honor to our shul to be able to host this observance. You might ask the question, why are we here tonight? There is a Yom HaShoah. The answer, I believe, is that the events of the Holocaust are too immense and too important to turn them into a token day. As they would say in halacha, to be yotze your obligation, to fulfill your obligation by making a day just to commemorate. We try the best we can to understand and to experience what they went through on that night and on all the nights and days afterwards. This is not foreign to Jewish tradition. In fact, the greatest tragedy before the Holocaust in our history was the destruction of the temple. And there isn't just one day when we remember the destruction of the temple. We do have that day. It's called Tisha B'Av, the saddest day of the Jewish calendar. But three weeks before, there is another equally important day, which is called Shiva Aser B'Tanus. It marks the day that the foreign army arrived at Jerusalem and besieged the people. It was the beginning of the terror. Tisha B'Av is not complete on its own, and neither is Yom HaShoah. <coughs> Tonight marks our observance and our remembrance of the beginning of the Holocaust. And Yom HaShoah marks the tragic conclusion and what it entailed. But who are we kidding? How can we imagine grasping even the smallest bit of terror that was visited upon these innocent people, our kin. What have we gone through to liken to it? Can we really recreate that event? The answer is clearly no. And yet, we are here to try to create something we're not just here to come, to honor it, to forget it, and go home and say we did it. That's not why we're here. But rather, we're trying to create something with tonight. 
I'm very excited to hear the story of the invention of Old Bay. <laughs> Somebody told me that he invented it to find a way to kosher crabs. <laughs> But what we're creating tonight could be likened to a spice. We have experiences that we hold in our hearts and in our minds that add spice to our existence, to the way we interpret the information that comes in every day. Let Kristallnacht and the lessons of the people who went through it and its history create a very powerful and potent spice in the way we think about our lives, and the way we treat others, and the way we expect to be treated ourselves. We honor and remember our brothers and sisters who were murdered with cruelty that's impossible for us to imagine. We ask you, God, to shine your light on the remaining survivors on their families, and on their spiritual children, who are those who tell their stories. We ask you to end hatred and cruelty and help elevate our hearts and minds, all hearts and minds, to see the good in one another, to remember we're all struggling human beings in this world. And at a time when there is dangerous anti-Semitic statements being made by celebrities publicly. And many people not condemning them. We ask you, Hashem, please watch over all the innocent people of the world. Guide us with passion, understanding, tolerance, kindness, remembrance. May peace fill this world as the waters fill the sea, and let us say, Amen. 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 Thank you, Rabbi Shapiro, for your remarks and for your opening your congregation to the community this evening. <clears throat> Crystal Knopf. The Night of Broken Glass, November 9th, 1938, exactly 84 years ago today, was the first time the world saw a widespread eruption of organized official violence against Jewish individuals, businesses, and synagogues throughout Germany, Austria, and the Sudetenland. The destruction that occurred on that evening and into the following day is often considered the precursor to Hitler's failed attempt at murdering the entirety of Europe's Jewish population. <laughs> Hundreds of synagogues and Jewish institutions were destroyed, burned in front of the public with instructions from local firefighters to only intervene should the fires spread to non-Jewish buildings. An estimated 7,500 Jewish-owned businesses and 267 synagogues were physically shattered as the SA and Hitler Youth broke through their windows and looted their wares. 30,000 Jewish men were rounded up, including the father of our keynote speaker tonight, separated from their families and taken to concentration camps. The only reason for their arrests? Being Jewish. In addition to destruction and arrests, 236 individuals were killed. For many, the November pogrom served as a catalyst for attempts to flee from the increasing anti-Semitism across Europe. They felt that life was no longer safe as Jews living under Nazi rule as they watched the government begin to strip away their rights of citizens and humans. It is estimated that between 180,000 and 220,000 European refugees, predominantly Jews, fled Nazi-controlled Europe and emigrated to the United States, 
between the years 1933 and 1945. Tonight, we are honored to have a survivor, Mr. Ralph Brunn, here with us to share his personal experiences of Kristallnacht in Germany as a 14-year-old boy, and to hear how his family created a new life upon coming to America. Mr. Brunn's insight and memories will help us gain perspective to the Jewish people's survival of this horrific time in mankind's history. Ralph Brunn was living in Frankfurt, Germany as a young boy on the night of Kristallnacht. His father, Gustav, was one of the 30,000 men taken that night and sent to Buchenwald. As we hear, as we will hear in more detail in his remarks, Ralph, his mother, I'm sorry, Ralph, his father, mother Bianca, and his sister Laura were able to leave Germany within a week of Gustav's release from the camp. Mr. Brown, we are humbled to hear and learn from you this evening. On his way to the podium, Mr. Brown, would you be lighting a memorial candle in remembrance of all those who lost their lives in the events of Kristallnacht and hope that this candle will be a symbol of hope and Jewish resilience. Mr. Brunn, I'm pleased to welcome you to the podium. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ralph Brunn, and I want to thank Rabbi Shapiro and uh, Bob Lowen for very kind remarks. I'm very thankful for being honored to be up here this evening. I was born in Wertheim, Germany. It's a small town in southwestern Germany. My father had a business selling spices and seasonings, seasonings meaning a mixture of spices and casings to the many butchers and sausage makers that were in every little town in Germany. Hitler came to power in 1933 when I was eight years old. And by 1935, two years later, the Nazis had made it pretty tough for Jews to operate a business, particularly in small towns where we lived. The problem was that everybody in the small town knew everybody else, which made it that much worse. So in 1935, we moved to Frankfurt, which at the time had a substantial Jewish population, the concept being there is safety in numbers. That was true maybe initially, of course, it was not true later on after a while. By the time we got there, Jewish children were no longer permitted to go into regular schools. But there was a very large Jewish school from kindergarten to twelfth grade, and that is where I attended. It was a good school. But things became increasingly difficult and limiting for Jews. Signs all over the stores, <coughs> movies, swimming pools, and so on. Juden sind hier unerwünscht, or Juden eintritt verboten, which means Jews are not wanted here, 
or for Jews and he was forbidden. So Jews found other ways to spend their pastime, watching cards, lectures, or just coffee crunch, whatever. Meanwhile, there were all kinds of Jewish organizations that sprung up to help the people to emigrate out of Germany to Israel, to England, to South America, and of course, if you were lucky enough, to the United States. To come to the United States, someone in the United States had to issue the highly sought after affidavit. And the warranty which stated that the issuer of that affidavit uh, will support the new immigrant here and the newcomer would never be a burden to the American government. Now you gotta remember, this is the 1930s and things weren't so great here in the United States either and about the last thing the government needed was additional immigrants to support. So it was reasonable for the difficulty of getting here in the first place. In the meanwhile, not all Jews in Germany thought it was time to emigrate. It was a mixed feeling with some of the people. They didn't all think the same thing. They felt that this Nazi hatred over time might blow over and things might improve. After all, our ancestors going way back had lived in Germany. We were Germans. Not only that, but the men just previously had fought in the First World War, just like anybody else. So why shouldn't we be the same as the rest of the Germans? Meanwhile, the Nazis had started to build concentration camps. Initially, these were not extermination camps. That would in turn become later on. This is not to say the Nazis didn't kill a few number, some of the inmates, but the wholesale extermination didn't start until some number of years later. These were prison camps for Jews, communists, or general anti-Nazis, just to get them out of the way. Now, in the meantime, to keep this anti-Semitism pot boiling, Germany had created a propaganda ministry. This was headed by a violent anti-Semite by the name of Joseph Goebbels. If you were to see him walking down the street, you would think that this guy was Jewish. He had brown hair, brown eyes, and a curved nose. And I suppose that he became such an addict anti-Semite was just to prove that he was not Jewish. The Nazis, by now, were looking for a good reason to clean house, so to speak. The opportunity came on November 9th, 1938, as we saw a while ago here in the movie. This Jewish, <coughs> this Jewish family For some reason, had been well, this Jewish family had come from Poland to Germany right after First World War, and one son, however, had moved further and went over to France, where he had lived at that point. The Jewish family, for whatever reason, had been arrested, sent to a concentration camp, and killed, which was not unusual. These things did happen there quite frequently. The son, having learned about how his family had been murdered, went to the German embassy in Paris, pulled out a gun, and shot and killed a man he thought was a German ambassador. It wasn't. Ironically, he had killed the one man who was an anti-Semite. This was about all that the Nazis in Germany needed to excuse, and to, as an excuse, in order to rally uh, go after the Jews. The SA stormtroopers storm or brown shirts, by the hundreds, mostly in big cities, went from one Jewish residence to the next, smashed furniture, broke anything in sight, 
threw whatever they could out the windows. We heard about that, we saw it here. And today, Kristalla. I have to believe that God interceded in behalf of my family at this point. Instead of coming to our home to smash things, the SA brown shirts, by mistake, went next door, where in fact one of the Gentiles lived, and smashed things up. My dad was in the street, I'll never, I'll never know. This, my family had received an affidavit to come to the United States from an old uncle that lived here in Baltimore. It was an uncle of my father's. By now, we were also in possession of the prize visa, as well as tickets for the ship that was to take us to America. In addition, we had uh, received uh, the permit of the, or the permission to fill a lift van, which is a large wooden box about the half the size of a, uh, a normal trailer uh, with whatever you wanted. And of course, we filled that with uh, furniture, whatever else my father stuffed into that. And in addition, a small milling system, which he had used for grinding spices, and a small mixer which incidentally are on display today at the Baltimore Museum of Industry down on Key Highway, if you want to see the thing. Everything was fine, and we were ready to leave shortly. Then calamity struck. The next day, in the big cities, all Jewish men, 18 years and over, 16 years and over, in fact, were arrested and sent to a concentration camp, my father included. He was sent along with a train of Jewish men to Auschwitz. It had become known among the local Jewish population uh, that a lawyer existed in Frankfurt who could be engaged to have men released for a very substantial sum of money with a condition as follows. One half of the money had to be paid up front and the other half immediately upon uh, the appearance of the merchandise that would be returned. Now, if this, this money was not paid immediately when the merchandise had been returned, the, money would, the merchandise would be sent back where it came from. But it's, there was a wording. It was on this basis my father did come back. Just the, 10 days before we had booked passage, on an American steamship line going to the USA. Originally, we were supposed to board the ship in Hamburg, but not surprising, my father decided he had enough of the German authorities. He called the steamship line, which again was an American steamship company, and told them that we will board the ship in Le Havre, France. They got on a train about one and a half hours later, we're in France with a big sigh of relief. We went on the ship and got to the United States and thought that there was the end of it. It wasn't. Everybody got off the ship except the Brun family. The problem was that at this point, we were taken off the ship, put in a separate steamship down there below, below taken to a place called Ellis Island. We'd never heard of the place before. <coughs> we were ushered into a room about this size, except the ceilings were probably 12 feet high, with little windows around the top with iron bars in it, all everything painted white. It looked like a prison, in, in the way it was. Inside there weren't seats like this, what they had inside were hard wooden benches. Forty sit down. This must have been around noontime. 
it was on a Friday. And we knew that somewhere in this building there was a room, sort of a courtroom, we were told, and there was a judge there. Well, we knew nothing about it. We were sort of sit there and nothing. We sort of sat there. About three o'clock in the afternoon, a man walked in, elderly man walked in, and the father seemed to recognize him, it was his uncle. So this elderly man and my uncle, and my father went over to the judge. I was never there, but I understand he just had to make sure that this elderly man understood that my father had a curvature in the spine, which was a very slight curvature, but might inhibit him from doing hard work. My father assured him that it was not so he could do anything, which in fact he could. When the judge was satisfied with that, and my uh, great uncle, my father's uncle, had to sign a few documents, we were released. And now we're free in the United States. Now, I wasn't aware of the fact that you want me to tell you a little bit more about what happened after that, but I certainly can do that. The, we got into Baltimore. My father tried to find a job here. And remember, this is uh, the end of 1938, beginning of 1939. Jobs were almost impossible to find. It was a recession here in the United States like everywhere else. He tried and he tried, it went out every day, and he had a terrible time. So ultimately, somebody at the Associated downtown told him, look, you know that business, why don't you get started? Well, my father wanted it, it's all that he wanted to be here. He had a little bit of money that he had gotten by the fact that he had a sister living in Boston, Switzerland, where he had accumulated a few dollars, and he had that to start with. So he got a few people off the street. He got a, a carpenter sitting on the street doing the work. He got a mechanic on the street. He couldn't do any work on the work, of course. And <coughs> together they went up on the second floor of a seafood place down the marketplace across the street from the wholesale fish market. And there they built the first beginning of what then became the Baltimore Spice Company. Well, all that worked very well. My father got started and step by step he was able to build this thing up. Since he was across the street from the wholesale fish market, these people came across the street to buy a little pepper, a little red pepper, a little celery seeds, a little mustard, uh, in order to make something or other to put on their crabs. Well, bear in mind that my father was basically a seasoned man. That's all he wanted to hear. Uh, he had made sausage seasonings before, but this was a different product, but he certainly could make good seasoning out of it. And he worked with this thing and finally came up with what ultimately today is Old Bay Seasoning. This was all very nice, and it managed to grow, and uh, competition, of course, came around, but the old base seemed to prevail. In any event, over the years, the company grew. We grew out of Marketplace, went to another place down Front Street. From there, went out to Paris, and we put a bigger factory together. Ultimately, uh, more factories in the United States, and six abroad foreign factories. So this was a success which <coughs> started by my father. He certainly said he was, he was the man who put down the foundation for all this business. Of course, I built upon it, but he's the one who put the solid foundation for all this, which is basically the story of the Bronze. Ralph, I know I speak for all of us here this evening, as well as those on, on the synagogue video feed, which is the 
the camera's right behind that wall. We thank you so much for sharing your family's remarkable story. We are, we are so fortunate to have you with us here tonight as a resilient survivor, as well as a local hero, as we all are as Marylanders. So love the product of your family's creation. While words fail to express the full sincerity of our appreciation, we also would like you to share, to sh uh, would also like to share that Baltimore Jewish Council has made a donation in your honor to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Your story is certainly a gift to all. <laughs> so we have some additional questions for you sent in by many. Uh, if there's time, we'd sort of like to open up to the audience as well. So, give us a minute to just kind of set up here. <laughs> Uh, no, I'll let you see it. Um, why don't you come over here because the video feed is right here. Um, yep, that's really good. Sure. That's good. Oops. Sorry, the video feed, you'll have my back. <laughs> the important person is on camera. So one question to start off. Um, while your father was imprisoned, uh, did you and your family have any problems? Well, as a matter of fact, There were, of course, people who wanted to take advantage of the situation. I mean, I had a household was gone, and in our instance, a man from down the street, some little nobody Nazi in a Nazi uniform, came to mom, my mother and said that my father had promised to sell him his car, the car was 20 year old and was in good shape, uh, for a very violent amount of money, which of course was not true. It just conjured it up because my father was there to deny it. And he wanted my mother to come back the following night. Uh, he wanted to come back the following night in order to get the uh, documents to for the proper sale of the, co the car to him. In the meantime, it was known that there was a Gestapo man, no less, who was quite friendly to the Jews. And my mother contacted him. And at the time when the man was supposed to come in, the Gestapo man was there a little earlier, and he moved into a living room behind the wall, and the man who wanted that car and made all the demands uh, came in the, into the uh, uh, dining room and uh, started to make all kinds of demands. When he was finished with the demands, the Gestapo man walked over and of course, everybody scared of the Gestapo. The Gestapo. I mean, that's the secret police. Everybody's scared of them. And of course, this guy just thought of his pants. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he was grabbed and he was told to get out of here and to report to the Gestapo department at 8 o'clock. I never know what happened at that point. But uh, he never bothered us again. So that's one of the things that did happen. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so, winding a little forward to the present day, or to, to your Old Bay experience, did your family ever anticipate the success of Old Bay? How did your family respond to the success uh, when McCormick Spice wanted to purchase it or was interested in it after your father had been employed there briefly upon your arrival in Baltimore? Without any tr uh, giving away any trade secrets, of course. <laughs> well, let me make a statement first. Vis a vis McCormick. The kind of people that they were at that time, this was three generations ago. These are not the same kind of people that are there today. Yes, they were quite anti Semitic in those days. They are not that way today. 
So I haven't said anything unkindly to him McCormick me because they're okay. They've done some very nice things in the meantime, two of the Jews. But uh, at the time, of course, uh, uh, they, they, life was difficult for them, for us, but it didn't make that much difference. Interesting. Um, how have your experiences as a Holocaust survivor shaped your way of thinking in life today or over the years? Has this impacted your experience as a parent or a grandparent? Well, I was 14 years old when I got here. I like to think that I'm thoroughly Americanized. After all, six years after I arrived here, I spent the next three years in the army uh, with their helmet on and a rifle on my shoulder marching into Germany. Wow. They were doing the army, not me. <laughs> Are there any additional lessons? Well, I want to get, I want to finish with that one. Um, with the current rise of anti-Semitism here in the United States, have you recognized anything that feels reminiscent of that rise in anti-Semitism in Germany before the Holocaust? Is there anything you urge others to call out as we're seeing today? And well, the important thing is to call it what it is, and not just by the Jewish communities, but I would like to see some of the churches across the country call it out as well. That's what's important. Yes, we can object to it, but uh, our fellow Americans should likewise rise up against it. That's what's important. To speak broadly across the nation about yes. Interesting. A couple of questions uh, from back at your home, back on your home life. Um, can you please tell us a little bit about what your home and family life was was like before Hitler came to power? Uh, the role did Judaism play in your family before the war? What type of work did you, well, I mean, we know what your parents did, that was in your speech, but just a little bit more about your, your home life at home before the war. Well, we were a, we were a family that did well. My father was quite comfortable in the business that he had done. And uh, uh, we lived in a nice home. We had a great big garden. We drove people there. And uh, it was a nice, easy going life, in, particularly in wartime. So there was no problem there whatsoever. Um, your family experienced the events of Kristallnacht in Germany, including your father Gustav being arrested in prison in Buchenwald. Um, I think you said Auschwitz, but I think it was whatever. Um, how did you, your, your father got out, but how did that all transpire? How did that come to be that, you know, the, the, the exchange of payments and whatever? How did he, how were they able to communicate with him? How were you able to communicate with him to have that whole experience happen? Well, we couldn't communicate with my father because right. we didn't even know where he was. Right, right. Uh, he was taken away, put on a train, and the train disappeared. We, we didn't know where. Uh, but somehow the Jewish community knew that there was this lawyer in Frankfurt <coughs> and he was obviously in contact with the Gestapo, although that's an obvious thing, and uh, was able to uh, arrange for money to get him back. So it was all done through the lawyer? It was done through the lawyer, okay. oh, yes. I may have missed that, I'm so sorry. Um, does anybody in the audience have a question for Mr. Brun? All the way in the back? Speak up. Speak up real loud. You said you came into a lot of violence uh, in New York. How did that happen to come to Baltimore? Uh, what took you from Ellis Island to Baltimore? The ship landed in New York. The ship didn't land in Baltimore. I'm sorry, can you hear me? You said Ellis Island was a yes. part of New York. That's where yeah. people came in. Uh, Ellis Island is part of New York. Right. And uh, I think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in many years ago, people would automatically, by ship, by ship would go to Ellis Island before they were admitted to the United States. Uh, now they only brought people who were questionable whether they could be admitted to Ellis Island. All the rest of them, which had their visa, but all, had already been cleared. So we were the exception, not the rule, because my father's back. Ellis Island being in New York, perhaps you would have stayed in New York rather than come to Baltimore. 
boosters. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The reason we came to Baltimore was because my father's uncle was in Baltimore. And he, my father felt that so many people went to New York and from what we had learned or assumed maybe, or I should really say my father more than me, uh, that New York might be a little bit more trouble than the rest of the United States because there was such a uh, compound pressure in New York for jobs, which hopefully it wouldn't be across the rest of the country. So since my uncle was in Baltimore, uh, he chose to go to Baltimore, not to New York. And you mentioned Front Street. Did you live on Front Street? No, no, no. The business was in Front Street. Okay, because my great grandfather lived on Front Street. Well, that was probably two years before then. Because when we were in Front Street, oh, okay. there weren't any residents. It's next to the church. It's where the post office is. It's the main post office was there then, when it was torn down and it was a mess. New post office was built in Well, that's before we got there. Anyone else? Right up here, Brad. Well, how was the transition in business from your father to yourself? When did that come about? I'm sorry. The transition between transition your between your father you. and yourself. Yeah, well, you. well, it was gradual, like father to son. Uh, sometimes it wasn't always smooth as you might think. It sounds smooth, but father and son is not always that smooth. He had some rough edges, to be sure. He always do. Uh, but uh, my father, of course because he came from a very poor family, uh, was only attend school until I was at least 12 years old, so he had no formal education. Now, I, on the other hand, uh, had gone through high school, one term of uh, college before I was drafted, and afterwards on GI Bill of Rights, got a full college education, and uh, I knew more things to do in business that were being demanded and he did, and he was very impressed with the fact that I knew how to put some glassware together. <laughs> Mr. Brown, my name is Stanley Hellman. We've never met, but I think our fathers met. Um, it was recommended to my father, who was a cattle dealer in Bavaria, to choose work, that he learn a trade. And he learned that there was a baker in the city of Donstadt My father was never an apprentice in the bakery. My father insisted that, uh, you know, that, um, no. Okay. My father had nothing to do with bakeries. He, he, from, in Germany, he dealt only with sausage makers. That's all he did. My father told me that Mr. was the other apprentice in the bakery. It must have been somebody else. It must have been somebody else. Sorry. Two more. Switzerland, was there a lot of family who was left behind? Well, my aunt, she was my father's sister. And she had married somebody in Switzerland, and she lived there. Uh, they, as a matter of fact, they did ultimately leave Switzerland and move to the United States themselves. But uh, all through this time, they stayed in, in Switzerland, which was safe. What about other families? Was there family left in Germany? Uh, oh, yes. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> my mother had a sister, brother-in-law. Uh, they wound up in Auschwitz and killed. And unfortunately, my grandfather, uh, he was in a Jewish old people's home in the city of Würzburg. And uh, they were too old to be sent in a concentration camp. So they came around and gave them injections. There was another person, uh, this gentleman with your rose hat. Speak up, please. He was the relationship presently with uh, Baltimore Spice, and, and who owns it right now? <laughs> <laughs> when we work for Baltimore Spice now, or? <laughs> when we were going full tilt at Baltimore Spice, <laughs> we built it up and with all these branches on farm operations. And uh, 
I had uh, four vice presidents under me, and we all worked day and night. We really worked hard, and it wore us out. So we were glad to sell at that point because we got offers to people trying to buy the company for every day almost. And uh, so after we really worked out and out, didn't have any more steam, any more steam left in us. We finally did sell all of our spikes. And uh, what was your question regarding that? Who owns Baltimore Spice now? Uh, Baltimore Spice Company was, is now owned by a company, uh, a spice company uh, from Germany <laughs> that somehow or other came to over here. The, the crazy thing about that is when East, when East Germany was merged together with West Germany and, and the Iron Curtain fell, what have you, the German government gave a lot of people money to start an operation in East Germany in order to get industry going over there. Well, these fellas did take that money, but they spent it over here, not in East Germany, and they bought Bumper Spice. <laughs> so just to bring it a little bit uh, back to full circle, um, are there any additional lessons that you would like our collective audience to take away from hearing your Holocaust story this evening? Well, the point is that there are a lot of people who have all kinds of problems and headaches as they go along in life. And you can't, you can't expect to have a life with nothing but sunshine and roses. And you have to face these things and you have to go through with them and do the best you can and work your way up from there. And that's really what we did. That's what a lot of the others did. We weren't unique in this respect. A lot of people did the same thing. Thank you. We see if we help us. Thank you. Just give me one second. So once again, on behalf of the Baltimore Jewish Council, the Holocaust Remembrance Commission and everyone in attendance tonight, whether with us in person or watching online, I'd like to thank our guest of honor, Mr. Ralph Brunn, for his time and generosity to share his personal story with us all. In these times of alarmingly, increasingly rates of anti-Semitism within this country, it is more important than ever to learn from the words of, of the survivors of the Shoah to ensure that their experiences of persecution simply for being Jewish is something we, our children, and our grandchildren will never experience. We thank the audience for taking the time to join us this evening of remembrance and hope that you will all join us again in the spring as we recognize Yom HaShoah. Thank you. Thank you again to our partners here, Moses Montefiore, Rabbi Shapiro, Dara Schefter, uh, Brenda Bergen and Jeff Foreman for your commitment to hosting this program. My personal thanks to Emily Goodman, BJC's Director of Holocaust and Countering Anti-Semitism Programs, and Howard Libet, BJC's Executive Director. Thank you for joining us this evening. And please drive home safely while it is. You are dismissed. Just be, be careful in the steps going down.